The 20th century happened and musical thought fractured and fragmented into lots of different strands. Some of them incredibly exciting, some of them incredibly innovative, some of them completely nuts that only happened for two years or so and we never talk about them anymore. But lots and lots of different stuff. So this is where you really need your pen because it's going to come at you really fast. So what did we have? First of all, we had the symphonists. We had people like Mahler, Bruckner, Sibelius, still writing symphonies, and the symphonies getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Then we had serialism. This was the first radical departure from tonality. It was invented by three composers, Schoenberg, Berg, and Webern. They're known as the Second Viennese School. They decided that they didn't want music to be in a key anymore. They didn't want one note to be more important than the others. So they took the 12 notes of the chromatic scale, put them in an order, and the music was about cycling through the order, going forwards and backwards, without giving any note any more importance than any other. It sounds very different to anything else that had come along up until that point. In America, America being a very new country 100 years ago, they needed their own sound. So along came Aaron Copeland, who writes music that sounds just like America. It sounds like cowboys, it sounds like people on horses, it sounds like wide open plains, all of that kind of original pioneer ideas you get when you think of America 100 years ago. That's Aaron Copeland. And then there was his friend, George Gershwin, who was using jazz sounds for the orchestra. He was bringing what he'd heard on the streets of New York into the orchestra. So you have a more jazzy sounding music. In England, we finally had composers to shout about after 400 years without any significant English composers. Four came along at once. We had Elgar, Holst, Delius, Vaughan Williams, and later on, Benjamin Britten. Their music is often quite traditional, quite safe, very English, some would say a little bit dull. The neo-romantics, that's people like Rachmaninoff. Rachmaninoff carried on writing incredibly emotional music for huge symphony orchestra, incredibly emotional piano concertos, as if the First World War and the Russian Revolution had never happened. He just carried on in his own little bubble. And we have the neoclassicists. This is people who are looking back at what Haydn was doing and giving it a 20th century twist. In France, we had the Impressionists. We had Debussy and Ravel, who also had a new take on harmony. Debussy in particular was interested in not using a major or a minor scale, but in using a more exotic scale, the pentatonic scale, the black notes of the piano, or the whole tone scale, that's a scale without any semitones, which leads us to a very open, blurry sound. Impressionist music describes something. It might describe a poem, a place, a picture, but it doesn't describe it blow by blow. It just gives us a loose impression of the external stimulus. Surrealism happened in France as well, led by Eric Satie. This was music that was quirky and strange and odd, and we'll talk more about that later. He had six composers around him called Les Six, who really pushed the envelope in terms of humour. And then as we get to the 1960s, we get the avant-garde movement. Everything goes a bit nuts in the 1960s. We have people like John Cage and Stockhausen who are interested in electronic sound, which is a new thing in the 60s. We also have Ligeti in Hungary, and we have Berio in Italy, who are interested in pushing how far musicians can, what they can do on their instrument. So they would get musicians to play, blow through their instrument without making a sound or blow in the wrong end of their instrument, or tap the keys, or bow the wood rather than the strings. That's called extended playing techniques. Then there was Pierre Boulez. He liked everything that I've talked about so far and did a bit of all of that. But in the 1960s, he was interested in giving the performer more say. He was interested in creating a bit of chance. So his music would be bound in a book so that it could be played starting on any page, upside down, backwards. He would throw the book in the air, wherever it landed, you would play the piece. That's chance music. That lasted for about three years. Then there's minimalism, which came along in the 1970s in America. Composers like Steve Reich and Philip Glass, they were interested in music that was created from very few ideas, tiny rhythmic cells that repeat incessantly. And the newest and best minimalist composer is possibly John Adams, who took the minimalist idea but moved it on even further. 
And you can't talk about the 20th century without talking about the great Stravinsky. Stravinsky influenced everybody who followed. He was possibly the most important composer of the 20th century, if not the most important composer who ever lived. Partly because Stravinsky did everything so differently and influenced everybody who followed. Stravinsky was a musical chameleon. 100 years ago, he was writing vivid ballets in Paris. They're all incredibly rhythmically energized. You'd want to tap your foot to them, but you keep falling out of time because every bar in Stravinsky's music is a different meter to the last. Then he became a neoclassicist and his music started to sound like Twisted Haydn. And then he went to Hollywood and became incredibly famous over there. Stravinsky is a really important name. Now we're going to hear a piece of Debussy played on the piano, one of his most famous piano pieces. It's called The Sunken Cathedral, and it's supposed to describe a cathedral that's under the sea and raises up one day a year to chime its bells. You'll hear that the harmony is unexpected. We've got parallel chords, parallel movement. Again, something that Bach or Haydn would have been sacked for. And listen to the use of the piano. Debussy was really interested in listening to the piano as more of a percussion instrument. So the sustain pedal is put down throughout almost this entire extract to give us a distinctive Debussyan blurred sound. So Debussy isn't following the traditional rules of harmony, he's following his own rules of harmony. And somebody who also did that was Hindemith over in Germany. We're going to hear a bit of his trombone sonata now, which was written in 1941. He'd been expelled from Nazi Germany for being Jewish and for writing music that was far too modern for them to cope with. Everything about this piece is unpredictable, unexpected and unusual, but there is a system of rules behind it. Hindemith was interested in clashing chords, dissonances, and his music moves from one dissonance to another, getting gradually more dissonant and less dissonant as it goes along. <laughs>
So in the 20th century, anything goes. You might get a massive orchestral sound or you might get an unusual selection of instruments. But usually, words to really pinpoint you towards the 20th century are unpredictable, unexpected, unusual. And music of the 20th century, particularly as we get closer and closer up to date, is usually really rather difficult to play, as is certainly the case in the Hindemith that we just heard. So that brings us nearly up to date. There are some areas of music that we shouldn't forget that we haven't spoken about today. There's the whole world of opera, music theatre, operetta, jazz, film and TV music, theatre music and popular music. All of that was running in parallel to everything we've talked about today and is incredibly important and could come up on your exam. We're not going to talk about it because we just had to draw a line somewhere.